Welcome everyone. We're going to get started. I imagine people will be continuing to join us um, throughout the session, but I want to start relatively close on time for those of you who um, are already here. So you're here for our panel. It's called Do No Harm, Community Cameras and Respect. And it's hosted today by the Philadelphia Photo Arts Center, Scribe Video Center, Mural Arts Philadelphia, Hidden River Films, and Termite TV Collective. We have a pretty tight panel to, or tight agenda today because we want to both hear from our two, two separate panels, really one that is community members and one that is image makers. And then we want to have time to divide all of us into breakout rooms and have a facilitated conversation about the things that you heard from those panelists. And then we want to return back to the larger group to have a question and answer session. So we're going to try to attend to time in this, and that means we will probably not have time to go as deeply into everything as we'd like, but given this is what we hope is a beginning conversation about the relationship of image makers and community members together in um, both the Kensington neighborhood and beyond, we will at least get that foundation started. I am Dr. Shelley Zion, a professor of urban education at Rowan University. And my work is really about the ethics of working in community with and for humans. And I also am an emerging, I think, photographer. And so I'm here just to bring some structure to our conversations. I'm gonna start with introductions of our panelists so you have a sense of who's in the room. And then we'll go over some norms and some structures and get started. So our community panel members, and y'all can you know, like wave and let people see who you are um, as I read your name and their little bios. I'll start with Roz Pichardo, who is an activist, educator, and survivor whose life has been deeply and irrevocably touched by gun violence. She survived an attempted homicide in the early 90s, and shortly after, her boyfriend, Talver Jackson, was murdered. She later lost her twin sister, Kathleen, to suicide by firearm and her brother Alexander to murder. In response to these personal tragedies and the rising homicide rates in her communities, Rosalind founded Operation Save Our City in 2012. She works primarily with the mothers and sisters of homicide victims to advocate for justice in police work and criminal investigation and for the legislation of stronger gun control laws. His, um, Rosalind and members of the group go door to door when a crime remains unsolved handing out flyers, gathering anonymous tips, and providing weekly support groups. Rosalind works at Prevention Point Philadelphia as the community engagement team's lead educator and has reversed more than 300 opioid overdoses on the trains and streets of Philadelphia. We have Luis. Luis is a father, husband, and Kensington resident who's been actively using and facing housing insecurity for 15 years. He is also an advocate for Safe House and works to spread the message of how safe house is needed. Then we have Gloria Cartagena. Gloria Smuches Cartagena is a passionate, active community member of 35 years. She works to help the community stay united and engaged through her certified trauma-informed approach. She was nominated for the Dorothy Richardson Community Leadership Award. Her hey, current hey. focus is on opening the Butterfly oh, Translator. Did I hear a question on the translator? Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, a place for families to play and heal. Then we have Shelly, you got muted. All righty. That was fun. Technology. Um, so Carol, Carol Restricher is the president and founder of AIM, Angels in Motion. AIM's mission is to change the way those with substance use disorder are treated one life at a time. And finally, on our community panel, Mr. Calvin Walker. Mr. Walker is a lifelong resident of Kensington who is active in the community, passionate about working towards a better Kensington. Those will be our community panel members. And um, I think we'll actually start with him and then we'll move to an introduction of our image maker. 
So I would like to start with Roz. And Roz, if you want to unmute, and just a reminder, you have five minutes to tell your story, and at four minutes, I'll wave my little one. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, <laughs> My name is Roz, uh, founder of Operation Save Our City, and I'm here to kind of like spread the message about how filming has affected um, a lot of things um, in my community, but also how it's affected um, how my family um, has been filmed uh, throughout the years, uh, some in the positive light, but some in a negative light um sending messages that aren't true uh just recently had my cousin who od'd and someone who recorded um my cousin od'd had wrote a message that he had passed away so my family was pretty frantic and tried to find my cousin louis when it turns out that he didn't pass away it was just the wrong message um so we're just here just trying to spread the word on how to film my community um, in a positive light, but also if we do film and take photos that is in a dignified way, but also in a way where we're not showing faces, um, but also um, holding the city accountable for their lack of actions. Um, again in a digni dignified way we're not showing people's faces um and i think that kensington has been in the in a negative light by so many reporters and people who come here um into the whole trauma porn and how they film our people um and and there's just so much more love to kensington than what folks are putting out there so um so I'm just here kind of trying to spread some love and understanding on why we, we don't want people to film um, people acti actively using or injecting and how it's important that, um, um, that people are filmed in a positive light. That's all. Thank you guys. That actually is a perfect way to introduce or to, to move into the framing and the norms that we wanted to talk about. Um, as a group, we want to do a few things um, before I move to the next members of the panel. The one is just logistically make sure that you have your video off and your microphone on mute um, unless and until it's time for you to speak if you're an audience member. Um, not in the panelists, the panelists can keep their videos on. Um, but the, the mute button we will shut off in case there's background noise. As you just heard from Roz, the stories that people are likely to tell will be personal. They are being vulnerable, they are being open, and we want to respect that. So in the space, we want to commit to a set of agreements. Whomever, like that. The first agreement is that we want to respect the stories shared and the people sharing them and that vulnerability. So if you're not one of the people directly impacted by this, it's easy to stay in your head, be intellectual about these conversations. And I want to remind us that we need to hold space for the emotional side, the ways that people experience this in their daily lives. I want to also suggest that our second agreement be that we have a goal of listening to understand perspectives. And so it's not about being right. It's not about winning an argument. It's just about listening and understanding and asking questions. That we commit to monitoring, especially when we get into the smaller groups or into the Q&A, our own participation and talk time so that we hear all voices and know that we want to prioritize always um, those who are the least often heard. Because we um, expect that respect, and you can see this on some of the images behind Pamela, for example, uh, we want to remind you that um, we will remove anybody if we need to, who um, engages in verbal aggression or profanity or personal attacks or making derogatory remarks about people or groups. And I invite you to use the chat if you want to, to add comments, questions, or engage with each other. 
the other thing I wanted to do is to frame this conversation a little bit around this idea that guides are thinking, those of us that were organizing the panel. And that is that image making is about making stories. Um, it's making meaning. And those stories and meanings become part of the way that other people view a place and a people. Those views becomes predictions and prejudices and inform policy and practice. So we have to ask ourselves the question, what is the purpose of the story we are trying to tell with our images? Who has the right to tell or to frame the story? How do you decide where to start the story? What perspective, whose perspectives do you include? To become critical in our thinking about our role in the community. And with that in mind, we really have to attend to the idea of power. The person behind the lens has power. Power to take over individual stories, power to influence the beliefs of others, power to create or reinforce stereotypes, and power to colonize a community. So we start this discussion by asking our panelists to share their stories about how image makers in our community, professional, casually, or as social media participants, have used that power in ways that help, or that heal, or that harm. And so I think what Roz just did was really to kick that off in, in the direction that will help us think and, and hear through the eyes of people most impacted by this about how power plays out in our choices about images in the community. And then we'll move after that to our panel of image makers um, to hear how they think about their role as image makers in the community. So now I'd like to move to our second um, community panelist, which is, is it Luis or Louis? Oops. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Louis Medina. And, um, well, I'm here to talk about the safe house. Um, really, um, as is needed in Kensington. Um, I've been here going on 15 years, and um, a lot of changes have been going on. You know, and yesterday, as I working on. Working in the store that I work on, um, there was a fire across the street that it was on Kensington that they had supposed to turn into a district, a police district. And um, <clears throat> somehow it caught fire. Um, nobody understands how it caught fire because the fire started in the roof. But, um, um, I'm trying to understand why they did call fire. You know, um, <clears throat> a lot of people understood that there was going to be a district. A lot of players understood that there was going to be a district. Yes, a lot of players didn't want the district. But there was a fire yesterday, and the fire started in the roof. Um, I'm trying to understand why. Um, if it's safe house, is really needed. Mm. But a lot of people don't want that. So you want to just talk about the, the filming? Mm. The filming? Mm -hmm. What you feel about the filming? Well, the filming is, is great. Um, a lot of people need to understand why, 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 why are we filming this? And why are we doing it? Um, and why are things are needed? You know, I've been here 15 years and it's overcrowded here, here. Very overcrowded, you know, as myself, as an addict, as myself, and as other people out there, we are, we are in, we are in need of a place like that, um, a lot of people don't want. But me, myself, and others that I talk to do want it. I just don't understand why people don't understand that it's needed. And that's why I came to this film and to make people understand that it's really needed in Kensington. Kensington is getting very overcrowded with a lot of us and um nobody's doing nothing about it 
you know, what they want to do is open districts and lock people up. And I guess certain people didn't like the idea and somehow the bill didn't go far. Somehow the bill didn't go far, so it's something to look into. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next, uh, I've got Gloria Smooches. Good evening, everyone. My name is Gloria Maria Cartagena. Everybody calls me Smooches in the community. Um, being that I am a passionate and loving person, and I like to help uh, people. I've been a community member for 35 years. I always believe in helping people, especially my Latinos. I started with my dad um, when I was in my teens translating. So this is one goal that I've seen that, um, especially in the Latin culture, uh, I can represent and speak for them on their behalf when they need help. And along with that, also I've seen, uh, you know, homelessness, hunger, um, you know, pain and uh, the above. I've been through trauma myself. So I am, about five, six years ago, I took uh, training in trauma-informed, so um, I'm certified in that to help people that are going through barriers that um, little do you know, you find people that you can relate to that are going through the same similar pains you have. Um, you know, that I can relate to Ross's uh, pain and trauma that she's going, because I've been through there myself, and along with drugs, and uh, I lost a lot of relatives due to that, too. Um, but the thing is, um, I live here near Kensington. I'm on Somerset. Um, I'm involved with Somerset Neighbors, a bit of living. I work along with uh, New Kensington. I'm a staff member there. I'm involved in a lot of programs. And the reason is, so I believe in helping people, especially in Kensington, when I've seen um, a lot of bad rep uh, posted in Kensington. And I'm one firm believer. I'm involved in a lot of events through organizations, uh, even myself, because I come from the 80s and I believe uh, neighbors being neighborly and connecting with one another, networking, sharing resources and uh, things like that of that nature. So I'm deeply involved and it pisses me off when I see uh, people, journalists that you don't even know who they are really, uh, just talking about the bad side. If you're gonna talk about the bad side, come talk about the good side, because we have a lot of working hard families here that believe and doing things for their kids and improving the community. You know, years ago in the 80s as well, Kensington was a beautiful uh, place to go shop. And I, I, can, I can relate, because I used to stay in uh, Kensington area shopping with my dad. Um, and uh, now we lost a lot of that um, due to things that are going to society. First it started with opioids, and then now we're dealing with this COVID, and people are just like, taking advantage of the situation, making things worse. We're losing a lot of business. You know, families are moving. Homeowners that have been in the community, been here in the neighborhood for years, are now scared. They want to pull out, and it's not fair. It's, and I'm here to, I'm not God, but I'm part of the community, and I believe in helping people. Let, we can fight this, you know. It's, 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 we stay united. We can do this. It takes some baby steps, but I'm a firm believer. I always say it gets greater later. And I see the beautiful things and the ugly things that are here right now in society and I'm in front of our eyes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, that was great. Um, now I've got Carol. Carol, if you would like to. Hello everybody. Um, I wanna try and share my screen here. I'm hoping I can find these pictures that I have um the main thing here right like everybody wants to take pictures of people that are out on this not everybody but a lot of the reporters and all take pictures that are out on the street of people that are down on their luck they're at their worst right like i had cancer i was bald i wore an, a scarf around my head right yeah people gawked at me you know but nobody took pictures and posted them all over facebook and oh look at her look at her when she's down right that's what they're doing to individuals these are people these are people that matter to, you know, they have family members. Like, you can't see it this way, and I can't find these pictures on my computer. They have family members, and I don't, I know, you know, people want to bring attention to things, right? There's, there's other ways. We have an event 
two events every year in Kensington. One is the 4th of July event and one is a Christmas event. And the whole community comes together. That's a beautiful thing. I am talking to everybody. You can't tell who's an active addiction, who's a community member, who's a volunteer, unless it's Santa Claus because he's dressed in a costume. That's how you can tell to him. But everybody comes together and that's what they should be filming. Like this, I was born and raised in Kensington. I was there till I was 26. Kensington is a community. It always has been. It still is. I'm still more comfortable there than I am anywhere else in the city. Hola. Okay. It Soy is, la intérprete. Habla Carol. ¿Me oyen? Um, quiero decir que Kensington es un Stop showing people at their worst. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, Mr. Kevin Walker. Um, greetings. Um, I was born and raised in Kensington uh, 57, 57 years of my life and uh, experienced a lot of uh, journalists, uh, this 2020 journalists in violation of um, people's uh, right uh, and people feeding right directly on. I'm in the street every day. When I'm not working, I'm in the street uh, helping out my brothers and sisters and, and, and to encourage them. Um, like I said, recently, um, there was a journalist, uh, full, like they towards it some of the time, full of uh, people without their consent. And I, I really get angry about it because um, uh, they didn't give no permission, nothing. Any anything I posted, I'll get permission of. Because the point is, I don't, it's just like, I don't want my, me to be a, 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 a film or it without nobody's permission. So what happened is that my brothers and sisters is out here sick and suffering. You know, I have compassion for each and every one of them. They have, matter of fact, they out in front of my door every day. And when I come out my door, there's so much going on, so much activity in my community. And I sit down there and talk to each and every one of them. And like I said, again, um, when I, when I, when I uh, walk the street of Kensington every day between one, one, one uh, one end to the other, I see a lot of photographers just, just posting people just like, if there's, there, there, there's nothing. And, and, not only, and taking a videotape of them. And I get, I get very emotional when I see them and I confront them. I'm, I'm asking them, why are you? Dice este señor que está muy harto, cansado de toda la gente, sacando fotos y videos este, en la comunidad. People want a way out, and some people come from migrate from different townships, different counties, come to Kensington and think they, they glorify this horrible, horrible thing, and they try to make uh, Kensington into be something that they're not. We have working class people every day uh, uh, trying to make a difference in, in our community because of the ep the epidemic and um that's in our community with the opiate. It, it seems like no one caring. And with the media uh, exposing a lot of uh, graphics out here, it's not appropriate for uh, even you, the young kid or the viewers to see to, to see what's going on. So as I as I continue to uh, move forward, showing compassion to my brothers and sisters that's out here every day, and you know, I feel I feel though that uh, there's something need to be done. So. Um, it hurts me right now. I get I get emotional because I just I lost a friend of mine. So she, we just went to the funeral uh, today, and I'm just getting emotional about it because we're losing everybody uh, left and right. All this is supposed to be like a public awareness, and here it is turning out to be a circus. Uh, I mean, like I said, I'm in a park constantly on up and down Kensington Avenue, just trying to uh, direct them to different places and resources because I, I'm a part of a lot of organizations that be able to out do outreaches onto the streets. And what happened is that, uh, uh, you know, I have compassion for a whole lot, and I see a lot. I see a lot. I mean, things that 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 uh, normal people don't even see. I see it. And matter of fact, and I talk to each and every one of, um, I speak to each and every one of uh, them out there on the street. My brothers, I call them my brothers and sisters because they are my brothers and sisters. And the thing is, they are broken, and they need just compassion and love. But but by the um, People photographer, I'm, I, it just is is to me it's sickening. To me personally, it's sickening because that uh, uh, now people start stigma, uh, uh, stereotyping that uh, Kensington is a bad place to live at, and uh, it's, it's 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 like uh, 
I don't know how to express it. It just is a bad feeling. And here it is. We trying to rebuild and our community for healing. We need healing in our community each and every day. It's just so many people in different corners. Some kids in the Somerset and a uh, kid uh, uh, Tuscan Street. We got little problems, little pocket, hot pockets. But the point in the point is about the photographer. It seems like every, we're supposed to build each other up, but it seems like it's tearing each other apart. One group versus the other group. And here it is. Each and every one of us want to make a difference in our lives to be able to build our community. That's so we can have uh, peace among our our. Um, uh, we have uh, we want peace among our brothers and sisters to be able to live in unity, but the more the more the photography that come down here and uh, I figure the more that they keep taking the pictures, just constantly keep constantly taking pictures and and and, and make us to be something that we're not. It's 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 it's, it's ludicrous to me, to me because it's it's harder for me. It's like it's more people now than I ever seen in my life. Because they feeding on to that, they feeding, they feeding on the, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the photography, the photography, uh, negativity, the negativity. Now see, I feel it. So therefore, as I, as I, I present my story, um, because like I said again, my brother he passed away in Florida, um, of, of opium epidemic too. And like I said again, I'm suffering a lot each and every day. I live, and I'm just trying to uh, overcome it, but. If I, the photography keep continuing doing it, so many people are losing their lives. They're losing their lives on a daily basis. You know what I mean? It's just like they drop it one day at a time. So Thank I would you. tell my brothers, okay, I'm trying to tell my brothers and sisters to, to be able to uh, just hold on to it and never give up. So that's all I have to say in my story. That's a powerful word that they build each other up instead of pulling each other apart. So that is the 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 um, some of our community panel for the moment and i think it's just important for us to maybe before we move on to our um image makers panel if any of you have any particular thoughts you can put those in the chat i think it's important though to consider the things that we've heard the themes that i heard just now was this idea of it's a community um we need to build each other up instead of tear each other apart if we're going to tell the stories, we need to tell a multitude of stories, the positive as well as the negative, um, that we can cause harm um, by the way that we take images and, and cause harm to people who may see those, cause harm to the reputation of the community, cause harm to the idea of the people um, that are impacted. But also I heard um, from Luis, the, at least the potential, that there is um, help if a message can get out, right? A message that can build some compassion and some support. I think there's a range of things that are important to consider in this. It's a complex conversation. I want to shift now, though, to our image maker panel. We have four um, different perspectives or different conversations to bring from image makers. And I'm going to introduce each of them just before their um, presentation because there are several that have multiple people within it. So we're going to start with Ken McFarland. Ken is a West Philadelphia-based documentary and portrait photographer. His current body of work is focused on producing visual and audio histories of Philadelphians in the present as a means of documentation to preserve collective memory while encouraging future generations to remember, re-examine, and realize their own potential. So Ken, I'm going to turn it over to you. You can share screen if you need to, and four minutes, I'll give you a warning that you got one minute left. Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm, uh, I'm glad to be here this morning, um, I'm, uh, this, this evening. And um, I'm, I'm glad to see a lot of familiar faces out there and, and, and residents of Kensington that, that, are, that are saying what, what many of us have known for a long time. Kensington is a very, uh, whatever you say about Kensington, Kensington is a very close-knit community. And uh, regardless of what you see on the TV, people come together and they, and they they transform like like Voltron when necessary, and uh, there are a lot of people that haven't spent any real time in Kensington, and what they're doing is they're uh, it's almost like they're uh, on safari, and they're treating the people in the community like you know like how they would treat animals on safari. But um, I, I'm short on time, so I'm just going to rush through this. 
And what I'm going to share my perspective, um, my, my artistic practice is, is different from many of the people that um, you might see walking up and down in Kensington and even that was spoken about of, you know, so far. Um, it, it, is, it, is, uh, it is a pleasure to photograph people when people trust their image with you, or trust how they see themselves and how their family will see them and how they will be recorded and remembered. It's an honor. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share an image. Um, it's not, for those who know me, it's not my typical fare, but I think what it, what it will do, hopefully it will spark, uh, it will give some fuel to this, the fire of this conversation. And I'm just gonna, in the interest of time, I'm, I could tell the story, but I'm just gonna read it. In the interest of time. All right. Uh, I first, this is uh, Sean. I met him on Kensington Avenue. I know some people probably in the chat probably know him. Um, I met him, uh, I'm not sure how many years ago, I'd say probably five, maybe more, I don't know. Um, but I first saw Sean um, from across Kensington Avenue as he combed his long white hair in the sunlight. His white hair glistened in the sun as he sat on his stoop with his eyes closed and his face to the sky. He combed his hair with a sense of pride and precision that left me feeling like each strand on his head had its own distinct story to tell. It was almost as if the stoop was his throne, his hair was his crown of glory, and his kingdom was Kensington Avenue. I imagine him as a modern day middle, middle aged version of what Samson might have looked like if he never met Delilah. It was obvious that his hair was a source of pride for him. He didn't stop combing his crown of glory as I approached. I stood there watching for a moment before I interrupted him to ask if he was making himself camera ready for me. He laughed and said no, but told me I could take his, his picture if I wanted to. As I framed the image with all the strength I had, as I framed the image, I watched all of the strength I had witnessed just moments before dissipate into what I can only describe as a look of posed despair. I've seen people change when the camera comes out, so at the time I didn't think much of it, and I told him to go back to combing his hair so I could reflect him in his full glory. He laughed again, somehow knowing what I was getting at. I saw a glimpse of what interested me initially, and I photographed the moment. As Sean was sharing his story with me, a woman tapped me on the shoulder and asked if I was the guy that paid people $2 for their picture. She was clearly looking for money and, and wanted to know where the line started. Sean knew the guy too and described him to a T. I told her I was most definitely not that guy. Explaining to them both that I make portraits of people that agree to be photographed because they want to, not because I dangle money in front of them. Something, something about the practice reeks of exploitation, especially in the area, in the, in the area of Kensington. When I hear stories of like this, I don't think of photographer and subject. I think of pimp and, if you're going to help someone, help them from a genuine sense of altruism, not, not of one of self-service. I couldn't help but wonder if Sean's affected pose was a result of what he thought I wanted, or is this contrived reality just the way that some photographers go about getting street portraits? How do these photographers present their images to the world? or they're being honest with themselves and to the audience on their websites and social media. I can only ask these questions. They will have to answer them themselves. I've heard tell that pimping ain't easy. I wouldn't know. But trust me when I tell you that pimping ain't right. And uh, this is Sean of Kensington and, and I'm, you know, I'm showing you this because there's a problem in Kensington whether people realize it or not. Photographers, the photojournalists, um, who can't afford to go to Afghanistan and, 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 and all these other places can afford that, that you know, the train ride to, to Kensington. And we have to hold them responsible. But more importantly, I will say this, that we have the, 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 the last project I did in Kensington, um, I think it was sometime around this time last year, it was about activating the agency within the, the individuals and the community in Kensington to tell their own stories right we have these magical devices we can use them to tell our own story and we don't have to wait for anyone to tell the story um 
of our communities, whether it's Kensington or West Philadelphia or, no, or, or South Philly, we can tell our own stories. And, and that's the core message that I want to leave with y'all tonight. And I don't want to take up um, time. Am I getting a nod? Is, is that nod? But that was an amazing five minutes. Well, well, imagine if you gave me six. We'll see what we can do. I gave you eight. Shoot. Well, <laughs> well, next time. But next but I, but I, but I, th I just want to thank everyone for coming out. And I and please do not sit behind these screens and not share your your ideas and opinions because, uh, you know, we have the power to determine and to and to control our own narrative. And that's the message. I, and that's why I came here tonight. So so please take advantage of this, whether whether it be the chat or the breakout room, stick around and please listen to these stories. And um, because I know some of the people that, that, are, that are in here from Kensington and, and um, I'm glad to see you and let's utilize this opportunity. All right. Beautiful. All right. Now we're gonna move to our next group of image makers. This is a group of three people and they get to share their five minutes. So that will be fun to see how they have worked that out. Um, it is Anula Shetty, Michael Kudemeyer and Iris Brown. Um, Anula and Michael are award-winning media artists and teachers of experimental and documentary media. They are recipients of a Pew Fellowship in the Arts. Anula and Michael have worked for a decade in the field of socially engaged media and are committed to creating innovative and interactive participatory and media, media arts projects with communities. They both teach at Temple University and are members of the artist collective Termite TV. Iris Brown is a community activist and gardener in the Norris Square neighborhood. She co-founded Grupo Motivos with women from her neighborhood to take over abandoned lots and envision gardens that would celebrate African and Puerto Rican culture. So I'm going to turn it over to you all. If you need to share screen, you can, and I'll, I'll wave the one minute flag when it's time. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's, it's really great to be here uh, to share our experiences. <clears throat> uh, one thing I want to uh, just uh, say before we begin is that uh, we, we actually uh, talked about having 10 minutes. Uh, so, you know, just to let you know, uh, because of, um, you know, uh, because Iris is also going to be sharing her experiences. So uh, anyway, but uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for including us. So, <laughs> thank you so much for including us in this uh, conversation. And thank you so much, all the community members, you know, for all your stories. Uh, they were so moving. Uh, so I, I just want to, uh, and, and uh, you know, and I, just to go from a jumping point from what Ken was talking about, about controlling our narratives. I think uh, th that's, that's been a really important part of our practice. Uh, you know, the, the topic of do no harm, uh, that is something that's really close to our heart. Uh, we first came across it uh, when we were, uh, this uh, documentary filmmaker, George Stoney, he was also a, a proponent for public access. And uh, he said, when you're filming real people and real situations, it's an obligation to do no harm. It's your obligation to do no harm. And uh, you know, one, of the uh, one of the things uh, about that is that, um, uh, you know, it's about how you rep, you know, the, and oh, Shelley, what you mentioned about power, it's about, giving people the power to control their image and to control how they're represented. So our practice, uh, so Mike and I have been uh, doing, you know, community media for the last 20 years. Our practice began at Scribe Video Center. We were facilitators for the Precious Places project. And that, uh, uh, and the project we're gonna talk about is one that began as a, as a Scribe project and then expanded. So um, what I want to do now is introduce uh, Iris Brown. Uh, she's an amazing community activist, a gardener, and I let Iris talk about our project African Garden uh, because we, um, part of our process is collaboration and co-creation. And that's what we've been doing. We've realized that the way to let people, you know, control the narrative, community members control the narrative is to give them the tools to tell their own story. And uh, so this was a collaboration with uh, a group, a community group in Norris Square. So I'm going to pass it over now to Iris Brown to introduce herself and to introduce the project. Hello. 
Hi, thank you for the opportunity that, for being here. And it has been an amazing experience for us in, in Norris Square area to, to have this film, to be able to walk around with these cameras and learn how to use the cameras and to tell our own story. And we all know that in neighborhoods like ours, it's not that often that we get the opportunity to tell our own story. So that was the importance of the program. As soon as I met Anula and Mike, we were in love because they, it was like, okay, how are we doing? How, you know, they were the experts, but we were the one telling the story. Um, the story about this garden is, is a beautiful garden. It's an African garden with roots in Puerto Rico. And it's something that we needed in the community because it was devastated by the drugs. And we wanted to heal the community. We wanted to talk to people. Everybody was afraid. They saw um, a person, uh, anybody that came to the neighborhood, it was a detective or it was something that he was not understanding or listening to our situation. And through the garden and through this project of making this incredible video together, we were able to put our neighborhood the way that we wanted to explain to people in New York, in Puerto Rico, in France, and all over the places because it was, it, it is, you must see that, you must see the video. If you have not seen it, please give me a call. I have few that I could share. But it was just the beauty that was, that happened many years ago. And we are still using this documentary and, and talking among ourselves of the beauty. So it depends who comes to the neighborhood. It depends who is that photographer. In our situation, we had two of the best. So we are very pleased and we're very happy and we recommend this type of professionals coming to the neighborhood. Thank you so much, Iris. Uh, so now I will just show you an excerpt from the film just to give you a sense of how the collaboration worked. Uh, Move tu mano ahí al frente de la cama. Ahí está. Ahí está. Ahí está. Ahí está. Ahí está. Pues aquí estoy cocinando, este, sancochando maíz. Esto es típico de Puerto Rico. Y estas eran las cocinas que se usaban en mi país, los fogones. Y, y, y cuando llovía teníamos que pasar mucho trabajo porque había que buscar la leña en la finca. Y cuando llovía se mojaban y teníamos que estar, que estar soplando, soplando, soplando. Teníamos que estar soplando, si no. Y los niños con hambre y uno ahí afincado, soplando para que avanzara a estar la comida y para cuando el esposo llegara de trabajar, era tremendo. Pero cuando yo llegué aquí, de sorpresa me encuentro un fogón. Qué cosa más linda, un fogón de Puerto Rico en Filadelfia. Um, it has been a year of a struggle with Ernestina being very sick. Then Paulina at the same time, she was very sick with cancer. But at the same time, we have been struggling all the all, all our life. So um, what we do is we have been using that knowledge and the wisdom and the unity of the group. And it has worked for us for so long that it is no way. We are not thinking of quitting. We are thinking on how can we get the group together again and keep on doing what we like to do.
Well, we have present is uh, the Africans that were taken from Africa to the Caribbean and other places. They have to struggle, and they did struggle. And part of that is in each one of us. And what we need to do is reach out and bring that that aspect that we have in us and use it. We are concentrating in the younger generation to pass the little bit that we have been learning, to pass it to them. here in this African garden, you know, it feels good. Bomba, when they originated in, in, you know, in its original roots, they didn't dance on stages. There was no stages. They danced on the grass, under a tree, in the open field. So, you know, it's, it, that's how, that's, that's the feeling that we as a group get when we dance here. It's like, you know, taking it back to the real, real roots where it really started on, on you know, on the earth. Yo me siento bien contenta de que estemos aquí y que esta, este jardín sea parte de la comunidad y podamos expres, enseñarle a la comunidad que no saben todavía algunos que están mezclados, morenos, blancos, de otras nacionalidades, que ellos vean que esto es parte de nosotros, de los puertorriqueños que este jardín africano es una de las raíces que nosotros los puertorriqueños tenemos en la sangre y que bailar aquí y cantar aquí en este en este piso de este jardín es como si nos transportaran a los ancestros de nosotros y otra de la um, de, de la satisfacción que me da estar aquí es que ya esto no es un lote de basura vacío que estaba lleno de basura sino que aquí hay arte hay cultura, hay sentimiento y que tenemos que querer esto porque hay mucha emoción en este jardín. So yeah, that was a number of years ago, um, but it yeah it illustrates uh, that process of um, involving the community through workshops. Um, one of the important things that we always look at is that in any uh, artwork, there's um, sort of four phases of the project. There's the planning, the pre-production, the, the learning, the communicating. And, um, you know, that for that project was working with uh, Scribe Video Center and their Precious Places project where they partnered up uh, media makers with uh, local residents and community groups. Um, then there's the next phase, which is the actual production. And for that, you know, it's important to share training, skills, um, have the community um, be the ones producing the project as far as filming and editing. Um, the part that most people always focus on is the actual video itself or the photograph. And for, for you know, a lot of reasons that is the most important, but particularly when you're looking at do no harm, you need to make sure that you have positive impacts all throughout in that beginning process in the actual production itself and then um, in the project when it's finished. Um, and then, you know, the, the real point of the, these projects is that they have repercussions that extend beyond the project and that um, really, in, you know, invoke positive change um, in the neighborhood through these strategies. Yeah, so I, 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 I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'll just quickly go through some of our strategies. Uh, you know, one is uh, deep listening. Uh, you know, a lot of times when we see films um, that uh, represent communities in bad light, those are, uh, there's a term, term called extractive filmmaking, where people just go into a community, strip, you know, like, uh, like mining, you strip all the resources and then you leave. And you don't really spend time to understand and to know the people and build relationships. So part of our process is to really pay attention to that, to pay attention to listening, to what the community wants, what the community thinks are important, and then building relationships. And this takes time. And in the world we live in, which is about chasing clicks and chasing likes and putting the most sensational thing online, 
taking time to build relationships is not a priority for most people, but to, to make uh, projects that truly reflect the community, uh, you know, you need that. You need that time to build relationships. And then the other important part of our process is the questions we ask. So uh, what you notice, what you would notice is it, it's not just the, you know, what you're, who you're interviewing. It's about the type of questions you ask. It's about who is asking the questions. So who people are talking to is really important. And so we, we so by training, uh, giving, you know, I mean, exchange, doing the skill exchange, having people learn the tools, uh, they are able to interview each other. So that it's a very different kind of conversation that happens um, you know, in that situation. And I just want to end by saying that uh, we're working on a new project now with, um, with uh, Iris Brown and Grupo Mo the women of Grupo Motivos. We're going to be uh, doing a virtual reality project in Norris Square uh, and with the African Garden. And we're really excited about that. And um, uh, Iris, I don't know if you wanted to talk a little bit about the impact of uh, uh, or, or about, or, you know, the new project we're doing together. <laughs> of course, um, the garden is, is just beautiful. I, I just finished working through the, the pandemic. I was working with uh, six teenagers from Colombia, Guatemala, uh, and the barrio. And we just finished, the garden is, is just beautiful. The art, is everything, but now we want to add um, an herb garden in the spring. And that comes with a lot of, we are interviewing people, we are checking um, what they have, what kind of herbs, what kind of herbs do they need. And we are doing the research um, for that. So we are inviting you to please come to Norris Square, Norris Square Neighborhood Project and you could get information on how to get involved and we love to for you to come so we could show you the garden it's it's a beauty and thank you anula and mike thanks to our i'm sorry thank you so much and we're going to post some links to our work if people want to follow some uh, some more of the work that we've been doing thank you thank you thank you so we have two more um of our image maker groups left the next one is Kaiser Carter and Solmara Valerio of the Kensington Voice. Um, Kaiser is a multimedia reporter for the Kensington Voice. He has lived in the Kensington neighborhood for over five years. Uh, Solmara is a first generation college student at Temple University, raised in Kensington, currently a photographer, reporter, and translator with the Kensington Voice. So I'm, do you all need to share a screen or? Yes, hey, I'm Solmara. So we have a PowerPoint presentation um, that I'll be sharing. Let me first share my screen. So Kai is going to start us off. Yes, so yes. Um, hello, my name is Kai Sir Carter. I am a, a current uh, Kensington resident for five plus years and a multimedia reporter. And um, my name is Solmaira Valerio. I was raised in Kensington and I'm currently a former resident. I have family that still lives there right now. Um, and I am a multimedia reporter and translator with Kensington Voice. So we're, um, we're, we're going to start off with um, some of the issues that I've experienced personally that I think need um, some debt that I think need uh, to change. So we're going to start with perpetua perpetuating a uh, stigmatizing narrative. Now, this represents the larger news outlets that only report on negative things like crime and the opioid crisis. These things are kind of um, what really like tie into and are the cause of uh, the second issue. Now, most people, especially outside of the neighborhood, don't really know like the neighborhood of Kensington beyond just like uh, say 
KNA or Kensington and Allegheny, or um, they only really know our neighborhood as like the Badlands or whatever other terms that is thrown around like from person to person. And then we have the narratives that vilify people experiencing homelessness and addiction. This occurs when people say things like, think of the children and as well as different derogatory um, terms. Um, these things really like divide these two communities of the neighborhood and cause them to blame each other for the problems that exist in inside of our neighborhood. So now we're gonna go to the solutions. And one of the solutions that I've used to rectify these problems as as a as a multimedia reporter myself is highlighting establishments that provide a space for marginalized people and offer an atmosphere for community members to feel at home. My first example is um, of Franny Lou's Porch, uh, which is a coffee shop near the York Dolphin Station, and the co-owner slash founder Blue Kind. Now, this coffee shop is important to the community, well, important to the Kensington neighborhood because it's a place for Black and other marginalized communities to be somewhere they feel they belong, you know, uh, to go in and feel comfortable and feel like they can be And, um, yeah. Yeah, and uh, um, you can go to the uh, side side. Oh, hang on a minute. I think you froze, Kai. So is it? Um, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, That's okay. So yeah, this, this um, second um, photo example is of uh, Joan Dancett and her daughter at the Roof Street Garden, um, um, the Pumpkins in the Garden event that was hosted by Philly Unknown. Now, this photograph highlight a space for community members to go in and, and have fun and like do various activities but it also serves as a reminder to residents in the community, even people visiting, that there is beauty within the neighborhood. Okay, so as someone who grew up in Kensington and someone who is now a multimedia reporter, something that I think needs to change is the lack of consent transparency and respect that there is when people are um, creating images or stories of people in the neighborhood so oftentimes as some people have mentioned before people take photographs of people at their lowest points they don't ask for permission they post them on facebook they make memes out of them and they don't really understand the impact that this have on this has on residents and people in the community so um, another point is treating people like access points. So sometimes journalists who are not, who don't know what it's like growing up in a community like Kensington or living in that community and have a privileged background come into the neighborhood and they look at people and they think of images and stories that they want to create. And so they, um, they treat people like access points. So instead of acknowledging that this is a human being that has real life experiences, oftentimes I feel like we're treated like, okay, well, this is just a photograph and a story. I get to check off my list now. Um, and I feel like that's something that's really important that we need to change on working. So some of the solutions that I personally feel can address these issues is developing honest connections with residents that foster and respect, um, that foster respect and empathy and creating narratives that don't further perpetuate existing stereotypes that hurt the community. So 
I'm sure everybody knows that the National Guard was in Kensington this summer. And I have a photograph here of Sergeant Kyle and Sergeant Mateo when they were stationed under the L. And I bring up this image because prior to going to Kensington myself that day, uh, I think it was the first day they were stationed there, I was seeing various outlets just post photos um, and articles that were basically just like, oh, here's a picture of the National Guard in Kensington. And there was no further context to it. And I think that's a perfect example of how certain narratives can perpetuate existing stereotypes that hurt the community. So for example, many people who don't know what it's like to actually be a part of the community may see Kensington as a bad place or in quotation marks, a war zone. So, you know, just having an image of the National Guard walking down the street with guns and someone sees it and they're not there, they're gonna, it's gonna keep perpetuating those images. So when I went there, um, I honestly just took the time out to just talk to them instead of just taking pictures and just going home and uploading them and saying like, this is what I saw. I went out of my way to speak to some of the National Guards and I was honestly just curious, like, what had, like, have you guys ever been here before? What's your experience been like? And I was surprised to find out that Kyle actually was raised in Kensington and where he was stationed it was a block down from his childhood home and her, his mom still lives there. So um, pretty much I feel like this is an example of how taking the time out to first connect with people and um, just talk to them can create very different narratives that I feel highlight positive things in the community. And also like while I was talking to them, I had some residents that told me that they actually felt comfortable having the National Guard there they felt more comfortable interacting with police officers because they were there. And residents would just go up to them, take selfies with them. It was like a much different experience in person that I feel wasn't highlighted by other mass outlets. Um, so my uh, second image is an image of Joshua Santiago. He is, you guys may have heard of him. He is, um, he's the founder of Empowering Cuts. So he gives haircuts, free haircuts to people experiencing homelessness in Kensington. And um, he's usually like in Kensington or Allegheny or he like drives down our different sections and he just gives people free haircuts. So um, I bring this image up because I feel like it is very important, like I said earlier, to have consent to take photographs of people. It doesn't matter um, and what phase of their life they may be in, what they may be struggling with. Everyone has human rights and they have the right to privacy. And so um, when I was assigned this story, you know, Joshua obviously knew that I was gonna be taking pictures um, for a story, but instead of me just assuming like, maybe Joshua already told um, this person that I was gonna be taking photos, so I'm just gonna take pictures and leave. I stopped, I, I introduced myself to Kevin, I told him what I was doing, I told him what publication I worked for, um, I asked him for permission to take the photos and I explained to him, this is where the photos are going to go. This is what the story is going to be. Um, and this is where you can find it. And he was completely fine with it. And he gave me his permission. And I was able to create this image where I feel highlights more of a positive, um, positive experience and it highlights their resiliency. You know, it's not just creating a photograph of someone in their lowest points. You know, they're both happy um exchanging in this experience and you know i spent time with them and kevin shared with me that he does poetry and he like rapped for us it was great um so yeah i mean that's pretty much all i have just really the main things is just treating people with decency and for me personally i think i'm a person first and then a journalist so i try to approach people as human beings you know just be kind and mindful that you know, as someone who is in a position of power with a camera, uh, you need to be aware of that power and how to utilize it so that you're not further um, harming these people in these communities. Thank you. That was beautiful. Um, our final community panelist is um, Janae Chitzik of Motivos Magazine. It says, though born and raised in the tiny village of Lindenville, New York, Janae Chitzik-Aguero went to work, volunteer, travel, and study in over 40 countries around the world, has impacted the lives of thousands of youth as the founder and publisher of what is now the nation's largest bilingual magazine with youth-generated content, Motivos. 
a Philadelphia resident for over 20 years. She is passionate about co-creating spaces and platforms for training, development, and impact where youth can find their voices and determine their destiny. She's been engaged in this work since 2006. So Janae. Thank you, Shelley. I just want to thank everyone for being here. It's a Friday afternoon, evening, right? You could be anywhere. Um, and some of you might be eating with your families right now, and that's why you have your your screens off. And I totally get that. My little three-year-old's downstairs sleeping, thank goodness, because he learned how to move the gate and come up the stairs earlier on a call. So that was interesting. Um, but if everyone can just um, stand up for a second and find a window near you. So just look out a window or look out a door. Everybody got a window in sight? Um, is your view blocked by anything? Is there a curtain in your way? Uh, is it dark where you are? Are there street lights? Are there any sounds going on that maybe distort your perception? So hold that and take a seat. And I want you to think about a window in the sense of a window uh, as words into someone's world. And the words that we use, if we can speak them in truth, give someone an idea um, of who we are. And if we're unable to speak, if they, if we are unable to hear, to listen, if we are unable to understand, then we remain strangers, unable to see the commonalities between us. And so it reminds me, this window, of when I was looking out a window in an airplane. So come with me if you can, you're in an airplane now, you're looking out a window, that's all you have to see of all these lights below you, completely foreign, completely different. I'm landing in Tokyo, having grown up in a rural agricultural community. I only know about five words because the internet didn't exist at the time. And I did the best that I could in my tiny town to try to learn something. And everything is foreign for a long time. And I can't be heard because I don't have the words. I can't share because I can't speak. And so I had to practice listening. And I tell my students this, listening is the first thing. Observation is the first thing. Before you speak, before you write, before you tell, listening. And so it goes to what Ken was saying earlier about telling your own story. It goes to what Anula was saying about can we give people tools to tell their own story? And it plays into what Somaira was saying about access points, not just access points, but people, humans, hearts, stories. We are each human. And getting to know each other is the first part of telling the stories. And so Motivos is uh, a youth publication. So I started it almost 14 years ago with that idea of giving youth a platform co-creating a space for them to grow in exploration of self, of who they are, of their place in this world, of telling their own story and telling the stories of their community. And it's grown from that point. Um, but it was important for me because I had that experience in Japan of being invisible, of standing out but not being seen and not being heard. And I know what that felt like. And I know what it felt like to learn another language the way a baby learns it as a teenager. I felt what it meant to not belong and then to slowly almost belong, to slowly be affirmed, right? And to slowly understand. And so I try to go over with my youth when they say my story doesn't matter. And they say my story has been told before. And they say, who am I? And who cares about who I am? And I say, no, you matter. And so we practice some of the after school programs that we implement practice you know, 10 minute writing prompts, et cetera, having the youth tell their story and get it out there. And so I wanted to show you some of their stories and some anecdotes. For example, a summer program that we were running in the Youth Net Center of the Ben Franklin High School years ago. And two immigrant students, Sarah and Aurelis. And they're both immigrants, but Sarah had fewer kids in the home, uh, higher socioeconomic level, more resources. Uh, and at the end of the, and they got along great. Aurelius was learning English and Sarah was learning Spanish and they were two peas in a pod. And at the end of the summer, I said, Aurelius, what is the biggest thing you're taking away from this summer experience, this summer internship with the magazine? And she said, getting to know Sarah. 
And I said, tell me more. And she said, I know if I have a question about college, I can ask Sarah. So the friendship that formed across cultural lines, across socioeconomic lines, across language lines was there. And it was a source of strength and a source of understanding and a source of growth. And so that is the other thing that happens when we create these spaces where youth can come together to authentically share who they are. And so I'm here as a proponent of making more spaces like that. And it's hampered by access. It's hampered by finances. It's hampered by the realization of the need for such a thing. But imagine these two youth, and this happens all the time, these two youth grow and they become adults and they go into different fields and they remember the experience they had with each other. And so when they meet another person from a different background, they're going to take a, a, a longer time to get to know them. And so I just want to share my screen um, and give you an idea. Let's see if I can do this right here. Uh, here we go. I want you to hear from some of the youth in the magazine. And give me a thumbs up if you can hear. I'm with Mia Concepcion and I am. Can you guys hear okay? Oops, I don't see anyone with their screen on to know. Yeah, you can hear. You can hear, okay, good. In the 2019-2020 Youth Poet Laureate of Philadelphia. This is Lucilania Loeb, and I am coming to you from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Hi, my name's Natalia, and I'm incredibly honored and humbled. Oops. Weighing hips this is what I beneath to say. is still there. Sorry, I still see so much yeah, beneath stark sheets in that hospital bed, that dead man's crib. I still see so much life. That ruby red flame of a head of hair envelops gray wisps, yet all the heat is still there. Those fragile bones tapping on the rails are still your swishing, swaying hips. Beneath those tired, fluttering eyelids is a fiesta. As a Cuban-American Yuma, I was able to briefly experience the duality of the Cuban persona. I learned about both sides of a lifestyle and a value system different from my own. The obscurity that clouded my conscience cleared as the diversified nature that lines the highways the humanity, resilience, and familial values of my own people, and the vibrant living timeline that is Havana, have all become fragments of my own identity. No matter how big or how small a situation may be, change will never happen without resilience. One must go out and challenge their opponents and see what becomes of their resilience. That was from, let's see if I can stop sharing. That was from the introduction of our resilience edition as an example of the youth that are part of the writing program and the after school youth empowerment program. And there's one other project I really wanted to share. I know our time is short, but this is an example of someone who comes alongside you in the work. And I'm so appreciative of it because you can be doing this kind of work for so long and you're doing workshops and beautiful things are happening and it's not documented. So I'm sure there's much more of this going on. And then someone calls one day and they say, we have funds and we know a filmmaker and we know that you teach poetry workshops. Can you help us bring in the voices of the youth for our community revitalization program? So this was part, it was funded by the New Kensington Community Development Corporation and it was uh, Ross was the point person for this um, as well, and it has students from Kensington, from Rock Ministries, from Somerset, and it's about how can we revitalize our community. And so Motivos facilitated us several sessions of poetry sessions. There were about 35 participants in all, and then with my poet ambassador, we curated the poetry into the five pillars that they were trying to look at for community revitalization. And there was a back and forth right then with the filmmakers. So in co-created spaces, everyone has a voice. Sometimes not everything you want gets in there. Um, so some, so there was some pushback and then we changed some things and pushed back again. Um, but one of the biggest uh, wins I would say that we got was that this filmmaker was used to taking narrative and poetry created and then having a professional narrator speak life into it. And the timing was tight, but I said, no, please let the youth do it. Give them their faces, let their faces be present in this project. 
And so he agreed and we pulled it together um, in the dark spaces of Rock Ministries to make it happen. So I'm gonna share, and one other point of that is during the poetry workshop, um, a young man was fiddling with his words, right? And I mean, these are boxers, right? Poetry is the furthest thing they thought they would be doing on a Saturday. And so they instead started rapping, right? And they're sharing with each other and one started bouncing off the other, bouncing off the other and beautiful poetry was produced from it. And one young man was, he wanted to say something about the community coming together in the end. And I remember being very careful not to give him my words. A lot of what he wrote related to water. And I've been scuba diving. I love the water. I studied marine biology um, as part of my undergraduate experience. And so my mind went to ocean, but I wanted to be careful not to give him those words because it's not his experience. And so you'll see by the name of it and what he says at the end, um, what his thoughts related to water were. So here we go. is taken over by table and chairs, banners and balloons. Neighbors from all corners fill the air with laughter and smiles. Hugs and hollers. People coming together, oh, embracing each other. Former bonds, creating strife. The drumming footsteps of people walking by, the delicate smiles, the story behind their eyes. The stories that carry us, stories that build over time. From your pacifier to your first paycheck. Where you come from changes you. Can you change where you come from? Here is being surrounded by cops and crime. People keep doing time because of the drugs that cops find. Family all around, neighborhood hurting, but you can't hear a sound. Sorrow into gunshots, beef into dead pops. No jobs, a broke person wouldn't mind using a mop. The little money we have going down the drain with the hood being isolated, we feel out of range. I wake up in the morning, I pray to God for another day. Because a lot of people want to see my life get snatched away. So I have to keep chasing. I can't afford to look away. I've learned the ropes of a senseless act. Seeking acceptance as I roll, a final lick determines if I'll be a class hit. My hopes and dreams dissipate with the smoke. Eventually the joint goes cold, leaving me alone with dark shadow. shadow. As the sun sets over the city, I look out and see a man pushing a stroller. I wonder if the scene will be the same tomorrow, the next day, or the next day some more. Or if the sun will set a different color and cast its hue alongside your trash heap and make it beautiful. Your needle riddled park and make them disappear. Your rude language and disrespectful glances and add a golden tone that soothes damaged souls and heals us from within. Like a Sunday with grandma, cocinamos juntos. My mother, my brothers, my sisters, of a family I took. From a different house, a different block, a different country though. The smells and smiles and laughter bring my heart back to Mexico. Change is coming. From the start of the church bells ringing, to the shouts of our praise and people singing. Change is coming. From the words of our father that resonate in our hearts, or the cries of our people who once fell apart, change is coming. From the church steps shooting up in the midnight hour, to the Sunday morning worship repenting with such power. Change is coming. From my window I can see children playing happily. My next door neighbor is washing his cars, and we all love each other for who we are. Though there is trouble. Financial struggle, the feeling you can't talk like you're in a bubble. But don't worry, bubbles rise. One day you'll be great. Your community will be there for you. Just remember, be there for them too.
so okay. I'll stop it there and like tie it right back to the first speaker, Roz Pichardo, when she spoke of love. Um, and you probably know the source of this quote, but love is full of joy when truth is spoken. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it never gives up. And so that's kind of what I want to leave you with. Never, never giving up, keep connecting, keep trying to tell the story that's in you. Now we're going to do the breakouts. Uh, well, the one thing I'm going to assume is true is that nobody had enough time to have all of the conversations they would have liked to have. But, you know, oop, music, there it is, it's gone. Okay. Um, I think that the important part of this is that as we had discussed, it was going to be like our intent was to start a conversation that then continues in different ways. So I think that what I would like to invite you to do is if you open up your chat and it would be really amazing if you could, you know, put some thoughts in there, things that either summarize what you talked in your breakout, questions you have, or if you have ideas and suggestions for next steps, like what should happen next in this conversation? Um, so, Start putting stuff in the chat. If there's something you can raise your hand, there's like a little button down at the bottom called reactions where you can raise your hand. So if you really, you know, have a burning need to say something out loud, we can maybe take a couple of comments. We have about maybe 10 minutes before we're going to turn it over to Pamela to wrap us up. So um, I'm seeing things that say how to bring information to a larger audience stronger sense of humanity, creating relationships, deep listening, not parachuting in or running away, but that commitment to the ongoing relationship. Um, a question, is the real issue the lack of resources that allow us to be fair and objective? Um, a question about the rights and subjects of photographers. Dublin relationships, relationships are key, build respect in relationships, it's good intention. Um, ooh, and deep down, I think we all know when we're kidding ourselves about our own motivation, snap. Okay, um, not capturing, reflection, capture is a violent term, reflect what we see compared to capturing it. Um, Mr. Walker says you gotta learn to listen, yep. Right. Raz, also listening. Um, how to get others to shift away from trauma porn to sharing authentic stories and pass the mic. Equitable standards for everyone that are grounded in truth. How can we educate and outreach the photographers, students, journalists who we perceive to be unethical in their work in Kensington? Increasing exposure and opportunity for youth to be able to tell their own stories knowing there are real people who matter on the other side of the lens. Not many photos of pride and dignity in Kensington. Hmm. Do the time and your work will show it. Better education journalism programs. I think that's calling some of us out. Yep. Um, making versus taking photographs. Mm -hmm. Anti-consumerism. How can we take these works of positivity and circulate it not among us, but to the wider world? Multiple voices, more nuanced and complex story, building each other up. Shall um, we? Yep. I have a, I want to hear uh, Nadia's point. I want to hear more about what she said about resources. I'd like to understand more deeply that question, if that's okay. Nadia? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was not the person who brought up that point. So if the person who did bring it up wants to okay. take that over, I'm very happy to pass the right. mic. Sorry. But um, uh, I, but I think it was related to, um, uh, you know, do we have the time and the resources to really spend that, like, you know, that much time in a, in a community? Um, uh, I was speaking as a former journalist, right, that if I had the wherewithal to be allowed to give, be given, like, you know, days, weeks, months to work on a story, that would be great, but I don't have that flexibility necessarily. Um, but again, I wanted to, if the person who brought up that point wants to respond, please feel free. Uh, I had to go feed the cat. Um, the, the, the question is whether people in the community um, are, are given the resources so that they can tell more complex stories that have um, much more of a grounding in relationships. 
um, as opposed to the kinds of journalists who or, or documentarians who, who parachute in and then once they've done uh, whatever it is they're going to do, they're off. Uh, whereas the people who live in the community, who have a stake in the community, um, have a, a basis for having a more in-depth understanding and relationship with the stories that the community has to tell. But we don't, we don't necessarily fund or provide the resources for that kind of, for that kind of reportage. Um, and that, I think, is what's really missing. Okay. Thank you. You know, I, I would just say something real quick. I, I think that was some wonderful points were made by uh, Regina. Um, and, and, and what I heard Nadia say is that, you know, people don't have the time to, you know, and I, and I, I understand that is a real thing where you don't have the time to tell these stories, but maybe you shouldn't be telling these stories. And I think that, not saying you particularly, but if you don't have the time to tell the story right, maybe you shouldn't be telling it, number one. But the main thing is, and I said it before and I'll say it again, I had to rush earlier, so I'm gonna take my time and say this real slow. We have the power to tell our own stories. So we don't have to sit down and wait for anybody or any resource to fall out the sky. Whatever it is that, whatever device you have that you can uh, encourage children to tell their own stories and look at their own image and how they imagine themselves. Because that is one of the, the, the wickedest crimes that's being committed right now in Kensington. Because the children are imagining themselves um, as less than or where they live as less than some other person because of the images that are being put out. So, so and I, I don't want to belabor it, but I'm encouraging every, everyone in here to tell your own story, whatever that is. Because who could tell my story like I could tell my story? You understand what I mean? In the way with the nuance and all of the flavorings that, 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 that add up to my story. And I'm not saying because my story is, is great. My story is great, I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't share it much, but it is a great story. But I believe that everyone on this, on this uh, line right now has a wonderful, or, or has an interesting story that needs to be told and documented, not just for social media or for uh, media, for, for your children, right? For your, for your, for your family. And then when we, we teach, the, this is a curriculum that we, that we have where we teach children, but it's, it's not about vanity and self portraits or, or selfies. It's about doc, document your own individual story, then your family story, and then your community story. And if we look at it from that perspective, uh, we can understand that we have the power and, and, and remember something. People can provide resources, but no one can provide or no one could give any of us agency. Agency is within our own selves. And, and once we activate that, then, then we have a level of power. So what it is, is, you know, I'm, I'm preaching this gospel to, to anyone who wants to hear it, regardless of where you're from, regardless of what uh, device you may use, because if you don't have a camera, just tell your story. If you can't record that story, write it, uh, you know, on, on celluloid, you know what, write it down. If you can't write it down, tell your neighbor. You understand what I'm saying? That the, the point is we can't sit and wait for anyone to do anything for us because let's face it, I've been around for a long time. They're not doing anything for us. We gotta do it ourselves and we have to demand that. Uh, we have to, you know, we have to demand this and um, I'll, I'll let it go like that and I'll pass the mic. I don't wanna talk too long. Beautiful, thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add to that. I think everything that everyone is sharing is like really important. And um, I just wanted to add that uh, Kensington Voice has a, a voices section where we basically just let community members write their own experiences and we publish it for them. So if anybody um, has a prompt or an idea or a project or anything that they would be interested in sharing, you can feel free to reach out to us and we can collaborate and you guys can write your own experiences and just, um, excuse me, share your own experiences and stories and we'll just publish it for you. So we're a resource here for you guys also. People are putting in um, 
additional resources. And it's, it, it is important to know as well that um, there are other community organiza organizations like Scribe and Philly Cam and Philadelphia Photo Art Center that can also help um, people uh, train them in skills and there's lots of uh, there's programs to to um, investigate um, uh, keep the questions coming though mm -hmm. I also think it might be interesting for us in our last like three minutes or so in the chat let's start putting in next steps like what would you like to see happen next mm -hmm. whether it's more conversations like this whether it's some kind of information, outreach, connection, like what happens next from this conversation? So those ideas could go in the chat or if somebody's got something they really wanna say, just you know, jump in. Continue, continue to hold, hold the media um responsible for the reporting that they do and to make certain that they come up with resources um, that the communities can use to um, form collectives form um, groups to organize uh, so as to get their stories out i mean you've got arguments that you make to your community but you also have arguments that you make to people who are not part of your community and who are doing things that are destructive of your community. Um, and I, you just, you never stop agitating. Never stop agitating. Maria, I see your hands up, but your mute is also on. <laughs> um, have there been any outreach to some of the photographers? I've that have been doing some of the you know for let's call it trauma porn or you know has has like i think that some of those folks are people who perhaps community members need to be talking to and engaging with and just the community of philadelphia the arts and the community arts community needs to be perhaps engaging with and talking to because i think especially when you're looking at perhaps younger photographers there are a lot of people who are looking to certain uh, certain images, certain things that have been out there that have been prominent and maybe following in some of those footsteps instead of looking towards really, you know, being, being more engaged with a wider realm of the Kensington community. Okay. Uh, I think I see Jay and Cal and Mr. Walker both. Jay Simple, Calvin Walker? I'll defer. Okay. Mr. Walker first and then Jay. Um, this is the most that I've seen my brothers and sisters sitting out here talking and discussing about each other. And since I've been out here on the street uh, of Kensington, we need more, we need more of this more often because the point is it's just to me, I'm feeling deep down inside, you know, compassion for the people that's hurting outside. And um uh, I'm, I'm able to speak to each other and have a, a relationship with each and every one of them. And not only that, because, you know, we, like you said, we all lost somebody and we grieve it in different ways. But the point is, um, as I'm sitting out there, uh, talk to each and every one, we need more communication and more people listening and learning. So therefore, again, um, like, we got to put our, our, our differences aside. So that, I, I just wanted to say we need more, I say, on hand contact and, and, and physical thing. And I love what the uh, storefront did uh, this winter, uh, how they uh, uh, opened. So, so many people have gifts and talent. That's how here on the street, they got you know, and, and they just don't want, they don't know how to uh, express it. So I sit down there in the storefront and just listen to so many people that came through it, the artists and um, electricians. They, they got so much uh, 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 talent. And I don't want to see it go to waste. We need more communi communication. So that's why that's all I have to say. Thank you. And then Jay. Yeah, I just want to almost just kind of uh, agree with what you're saying. Like I think that, um, and even what Ken's saying too about um, that we have like the power to be able to to capture our own sort of stories and narratives. Because I mean, what's happening here is like is what's happening all around the country and what's happened like historically, like uh, 
representations of communities. And I think when we say communities, we know we're not talking about like, I know Hollywood Boulevard, we're talking about, uh, you know, a different demographic, a different makeup of a community when we say that, right? And I think those communities have always been uh, displayed uh, negatively by media and by sort of the more mainstream sort of, of way of looking. And so I think that we are always going to be the ones that are going to tell our stories properly. But we can only do that if we use the tools that are, you know, in front of us to be able to use, but then also, uh, you know, each one teach one. So we really need to be, you know, every one of us who has that kind of level of knowledge about how these tools are used, we need to be out here uh, lending our voice to, you know, generation to come because otherwise, right, everyone's just going to be continuously stuck in that, that cycle. Thank you. Uh, Pamela, Pam, where are you at? I'm here. There you go. Okay. Shelly, thank you, Shelly. I'm just here to, uh, to send everyone off with some gratitude tonight. I want to send a big shout out of thanks to, uh, to our moderator, Shelly. Thank you so, so much, Shelly, for holding this discussion and holding space for us. I want to thank the planning team. This event absolutely wouldn't have happened without our team, which is Shelly, Lori, Ken, Anula, Juliana, Roz, did I say Ken? I should say Ken twice anyway. Tony, Jim, I think that's our whole team there. Um, we work together as a group from many different organizations to make this event happen. And I just really wanna thank them for coming together and making this happen. I also wanna thank our translator, Catherine. Thank you very much for providing Spanish translation for us tonight. Thank you. I want to thank all of our sponsors and co-sponsors, Mural Arts Philadelphia. This program was brought to you by the Kensington Storefront, which is a program of the Porchlight Department of Mural Arts Philadelphia. And our co-sponsors, Scribe, Philly Cam, whoa, nope, Philly Photo Art Center. Thank you so much to them. Thank you, thank you. And Hidden River Films. Thank you all for helping to make this happen. And of course, thank you to our audience members for coming. Thank you for being part of this discussion. I'm gonna be taking um, a chat, I'm gonna save it. And we are gonna be working towards a poster campaign among other things as follow up um, to put in Kensington, to put some of these, these things that we've come up with together out there into the public sphere. Um, you will be getting a follow up email if you registered with the recording of this event, as well as some follow up resources. So if you wanna be part of the continued conversation, keep an eye on your email inbox. I'm also available as the Kensington Storefront Program Manager. If you would like to be in touch with me, you're welcome to private message me here. I'll hang out a few minutes after the event. So that is all from me. And that is all from us. Thank you all so very much for coming tonight. Thank you for sharing your stories. Thank you to our panelists for sharing their, their amazing creativity, our image makers, our community members. Thank you, thank you, and thank you again. Be well, everybody. Take care out there. Thanks, facilitators. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Take care, everybody. Did you want us to send notes from the breakouts or how did you want to collect that?